Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. Uh, good whatever time of day it is. Now, for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is that we've decided to talk about uh, tonight. And of course, we'll be talking about observations of travel with my guests, Kay Poe, to my left here. To my right here is John Francis. And they've guested on the show before, but it's been a while now. And it seems the last time we talked about political and social issues for the most part. But this time it'll be a little different flavor because you've done some extensive traveling. And from the stories you've told me before the show started, it's going to be an interesting sort of a show. You've got some uh, clips of, uh, that you made of the places you've gone to, and you'll be talking about those. And uh, we'll hear from both of you about your adventures and your feelings when you were in these places and stuff you learned. But first of all, let's open this show as we usually do with what I call the bio segment. And that's where I talk to you about who you are personally so that the viewers have an idea uh, why it is you loved uh, where you went and your impressions to, uh, about where you went. So let's start with the bio segment. Who are you? Okay. Uh, first of all, I need to ask you, how are you feeling right now? I'm kind of nervous because this is the first show we've done in the new TVC TV <laughs> studios, and it's a whole different ball game than the old studio, but we're working it out, and it's going to be fine. So I'm a little nervous, but I'm fine otherwise. And how are you, Kay? I'm great. I'm fine. I'm a little nervous about making a trip to Madagascar next month. But, uh, You're going to be on the road again. Yeah, on the road again. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And how are you feeling about oh, that? Oh, I'm, fe yeah, just, uh, you know, a little tense because I'm not used to being on television. But, uh, uh, yeah, we're both looking forward to Madagascar. We're going to be teaching at a school there, and uh, I'm going to be doing a bit of video over there as well. So, uh -huh. and which is what we did um, some time ago. We were teaching in India also, and uh, I was, again, doing video, and Kay was teaching, doing some other things there. Um, over the past couple of years, because we've been traveling, you know, at different times, uh, um, we put together just uh, clips, you know, just little uh, snapshots, really, of the different things we were doing, just to illustrate, in a way, the principles uh, that, you know, we developed while we were traveling. We're not, uh, um, there's nothing more boring than watching slides of somebody's uh, trip, you know, here we are in uh, Paris or something. But at any rate, my background was in, uh, was in video production. Uh, I used to work at the University of Idaho and at Washington State University before retiring and moving to Portland, where I was lucky enough to meet Kay. And so and, uh, she's got a totally different background, business executive. Mm, yeah. Business executive. Yeah, I was um, purchasing manager at uh, Paper Mill on the West Coast here, one of the largest recycled paper mills in Newburgh. Uh -huh. and, uh, so let me go to my cheat sheet, and then we'll get further into the, the topic of the show, the observations okay. of travel. Great. And uh, your full name, John Francis what? Mm -hmm. Just John Francis. No yeah. middle name? Oh, A. John A. <laughs> John <laughs> Arthur Francis. John yeah. Arthur Francis. Yeah. And by the way, if I ask you a question along the way and you don't want to answer, uh, mm. just say, hey, forget about it. I'm not going to answer that or whatever. Okay. Mm. I prefer to take the Fifth Amendment, Fifth actually. Amendment. It's, a little, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more, uh, you know, energetic, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And K. Poe, and what's huh? your, do you have a middle name? Well, actually, it's Catherine, Catherine May, but uh, I started spelling that in Catholic school, C A Y E. <laughs> so I've gone by K for a long time. Uh -huh. It sounds like a breakfast cereal, doesn't it, K Poe? <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it's going to be the rest of the evening? <laughs> yes, it will be. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you're, uh, you're a Catholic, you're still Catholic? Um, fallen away Catholic, you're right. <laughs> so am I. How about you, John? Were you Catholic? No. Uh, you didn't no, have that emotion. No, no, Protestant. Protestant. Yeah, mm. Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> Canadian. And, mm. uh, when and uh, where were you born? Oh, I was uh, born in Winnipeg and raised in Calgary, but I've been in the States since the 
the late 60s, I came down to study at the University of California, and uh, I've been down uh, in the States ever since, except for traveling. And that was after traveling in Africa for how long? No, I spent about seven years altogether in Africa. Just yeah, hitchhiking? Hit hitchhiking mostly. In hitchhiking. Yeah. A lot of the time. <laughs> well, no, I wasn't hitchhiking the whole time. I was, uh, that's how I traveled, but I was working. You know, I worked like uh, uh, in North Africa. I worked a year in Israel on a kibbutz, and I was down in... Um, working in what was now Zimbabwe, uh, Rhodesia, for a couple of years, and in South Africa, and traveling through the other countries, you know, Mozambique and uh, Tanzania, places like that. So you had a lifetime of that kind of traveling? Mm. Well, for, for some time I was doing it, yeah. It was, uh, in fact, I remember once uh, I'd been traveling for, uh, hitchhiking for a long time, and I got onto a kibbutz in Israel, and I don't think I went outside the gates of the kibbutz for six weeks. It was just such a relief to stay in one place, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I've li it's been fun to travel around to these, uh, some of these different places. I was lucky to going through Africa in the 60s and 70s because that's quite a time ago. Africa has really fallen into uh, a sad state since that time, you know. Uh, what with AIDS and a lot of the wars going on, it's been deteriorating. And it, that's not the fault of the Africans necessarily, or certainly not most of them. Uh-huh. And did you travel with John? No, John and I have only been together for, what, a About little over 10 years. years. Yeah. And uh, so it's been a, quite an experience for 10 years. So mm. When I met John, I immediately retired, married him, and we took off. And you, t you traveled too? Yeah, we put a pack on our back and <laughs> took off to Mexico. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I'm sure you've got some stories. Can you stick around for four hours? It looks like we're going to need four hours to cover your stories. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, no, there's a lot of people that we've met have been traveling a lot more than we have. So. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. This, oh, the, especially, the, we'll get into the travel club later that we belong to, but uh, sure. you'll find that a lot of these people are real veterans. So anything significant about your cultural heritage that's worth uh, repeating now, or are you just plain American white bread, Canadian white bread? Mm. Uh, yeah, American yeah, well, bread. American well, now, yeah. Uh, well, my grandmother was born in Romania, and she um, told me a little bit about her country, but not much. And so I took my granddaughter when she was 17 to Romania with me and uh, 15 years ago. And she's, my granddaughter is now 27, and she's in her 30s, excuse me, in her 30s. And she said it changed her life. Mm -hmm. And so I really think travel's important at any age. When are you going to stop traveling? Oh, um, probably. <laughs> Who knows? Hey, it just depends. Yeah. We, have it. we don't see the end yet. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we're to take it one time at a time. My eyes are pretty bad, so at some point I may have to stop. But at any rate, I think that traveling does a, a lot for people, uh, particularly if they take a little time when they're there and uh, get to know some of the people. Because uh, um, it's only when you've been traveling for a while that you realize how different, uh, you know, how, how different c cultures work, how different societies function. And uh, you become a little less uh, uh, sure that your own views are always the right ones. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that uh, um, <coughs> there, I know there's uh, philosophies in high school or there are programs in high school where uh, some, some kids go abroad for a year or mm -hmm. other people come here for a year, you know. And I'd like to see that almost universal. I mean, it would be wonderful if every American high school kid could go over and live in another country for a year, you know, teach them how different people think and how, how the world works in different ways, you know. How about your formal education? Uh, do you have some degrees? Uh? Well, I, I took a political science degree at the University of Alberta and then uh, hitchhiked around. Uh, that's when I started my uh, five years or seven years of hitchhiking after that. I worked as a journalist for a little while in Calgary and then hitchhiked. And then um, I got really interested, in, read Marshall McLuhan and got really interested in movies, you know. And uh, this was at the time in the late 60s when uh, there was all the underground movies and Easy Rider and all that kind of stuff. So I got um, admitted to UCLA in the master's program in film. And so uh, went down there and uh, loved it and got a chance to shoot film up in, uh, at Washington State University after that. And I've been in the States ever since, you know, mostly doing video production. How about children? Either one of you have children? Mm. Yeah. I've got I've got one son. He's now uh, he's taken up traveling as well. He's teaching in uh, Honduras, and mm -hmm. he's been teaching in Ecuador before that. He was a journalist up in the Skagit Valley Herald. Uh -huh. um, 
but now, uh, now he's off in, uh, into Central and South America, mostly as a, as a cheap way to learn Spanish, he says. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's our companion when we travel once in a while, too. Yeah. And yeah. Kay has got... Uh, I have um, a boy and a girl and uh, two granddaughters, and I also now have a great-granddaughter also. My education came about a little great. bit... Well, my education came out a little differently than, <laughs> than uh, normal. I uh, was married at the age of 16, and my first child I had at 16, and my second one at 18. Oh, wow. And so um, back then, you were immediately told to leave school. And so I um, wasn't able to get my high school education until I went back and got a GED. And then from there, I went on to community college. And when I started working at the mill, they offered to uh, put me in management if I got a degree. So I went off, and, <laughs> and they paid for it. And I got a degree from uh, Linfield and, uh, in psychology. And then I went on and got a master's from George Fox University. And the friends group um, at George Fox really impressed me. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> uh, the political persuasion, is that a fair question? Are you left, right, center, or a member of the Tea Party <laughs> of the John Birch Society? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, my, um, I don't know. Uh, I guess the closest group that I feel aligned with is David Delk's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alliance, Alliance for, for Democracy. Yeah, uh, David, we're talking about yeah. ending, mm -hmm. ending of corporate personhood. I think the country's very mm -hmm. much on the wrong track. I think there's, uh, in fact, I mean, I think we have corporate rule in this country. For they've, you know, it's captured the uh, uh, the electoral process as well as the business process. And uh, how many times do, if you were letting somebody drive a car, how many times would they crash it before you decided maybe they shouldn't be driving it? You know? Are you of the same? Uh, my my political persuasion is in a complete evolution stage from <laughs> start to finish. Uh -huh. <laughs> she hears me ranting, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds no. like me and my wife. My yeah. wife is rather moderate or centrist, mm -hmm. but somewhat leftist leanings, mm -hmm. and I'm so far left, I'm falling off the edge of the <laughs> continuum. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's really scary, you know, when you see they talking about, hey, we've got to do more oil drilling and gasoline prices have got to be kept low. I mean, my God, you know, we're close to getting to uh, global, you know, global warming is coming up faster than people think. And in 30 or 40 years, we're not going to be able to turn back. You know, it's going to be, it's, it's going to have its own feedback loop and we're not going to be able to stop it. You know? So what are you doing to uh, head this off or to counter the direction we're heading? Um, Working on a couple of uh, small video projects that I'm, you know, putting on the internet, but I'm not sure that anybody can stop it now. I'm a little bit of a pessimist on this. We, John and I, do volunteer, and, and we're volunteer clean up the highway, and we have three stretches of highway that we do, and uh, we are also uh, master recyclers in our area, and so we do a lot of volunteering, and, and I think that's important. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And memberships in political or social or civic organizations that are worth mentioning? Well, I'm a volunteer uh, mediator with our uh, school. Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, we've mediated in the past for the uh, for small the claims court victim your offender. Your community mediators, yeah, which is a Yamhill County organization, and and so uh, we worked for several years doing uh, small claims court mediation. And yeah. I did victim offender mediation and. Um, uh, neighbor to neighbor, and quite a few. And then now we, we mediate um, a coach or a coach at the school in Dayton for mediation. The kids do mediation on their own. It's a wonderful program. How do you get to be a mediator? What do you have to learn uh, to, to, to be uh, a successful mediator? Oh, <laughs> I take a course at George mm -hmm. Fox's yeah. university. Oh, yeah. very good at uh, yeah. the Quaker courses. Uh, yeah. Quaker and um, we were when we were in Egypt, we met uh, a, a guy mm -hmm. over there who was, you know, working with refugees, etc. And uh, he was in charge of a bunch of NGOs, and he had come from George Fox University, you know, mm -hmm. learning to be a mediator. So it's a it's a it's a place that's um, kind of well known internationally. Mm -hmm. Okay. So last question before we get into the, the meat of the show. <laughs> uh, persons from the past or alive today that you look up to or looked up to or admire. Any names come to mind? <laughs> My old buddy Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Which hardly counts, I guess. Uh, no, of he went course to, it yeah, counts. We were high school kids together. That's really all. Really, were you? Yeah, I didn't know him well or anything. That He was a pretty tough kid, you know. He knocked me down once. But, uh, <laughs> no, but as far as famous one. people are concerned, no, I don't think so. Um, uh -huh. No. Um, Joe Clark uh, was a buddy of mine, my, my editor, and he became Prime Minister of Canada for about nine months, mm -hmm. I think, that's all. Somebody said, why was he carrying a turkey under his arm and spare parts? No. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> but uh, no, no uh, unfortunately, nobody famous. I don't know about Kay. Well, I'm impressed with Bill Gates. So ah, Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, I think he's got it right, business and, and uh, community and caring and, mm -hmm. no. Okay. So let us then transition over in about oh, 15 minutes or so, we'll take a break. But uh, until then, let's just start off with the main part of the show to allow enough time for you people to talk about your travels mm -hmm. and your impressions and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So will you take over now and I'll be the listener for a while? Okay. <laughs> last, uh, last year, just about a year ago actually, we, uh, we went over to Egypt. This was just at the time when uh, uh, they had just finished the riots. Mubarak had been kicked out. And so uh, I've just got a bit of, uh, let's see, some stuff here on the, whoop. Well, it was supposed to come. Yeah, it's there, John. Yeah, except the video's not there. It'll be there. It'll be there. Our director, there, there it is. Guy yeah, coming there it is. There it's we go. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Oh, I see. It's He's up in the corner. It's playing, John. Yeah, right. We were, yeah, they, w this is in Cairo. The, and the first thing they did is take us to Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. And really? there's, uh, yeah, that's Tahrir Square. There's K. They told her they were yelling at her not to take uh, pictures, but uh, she did anyway. And, and you were uh, there. Yeah, and uh, that's the first place they take you is Tahrir Square uh, when you get to Egypt now. It's, uh, they're marketing the revolution. And uh, th that's the sidewalks at Tahrir Square. They've been all ripped up. And so people can throw throw uh, rocks with them. That's all. But then then we went up uh, up the Nile River on um, the uh, on uh, on boat. It was the standard Egyptian tour, you know, where you go up and see a lot of the uh, wonderful uh, old um, ruins that are so much a part of Egypt, Egypt and yeah. the stuff, you know, Karnak and Luxor. And uh, uh, frankly, I get kind of get them mixed up now. Uh, you know, looking back on them, they. Ordinarily, th this would be wall-to-wall -wall people, uh -huh. and you'll notice that there's virtually nobody there at all. We had a, we had these big temples and everything all to ourselves. But why and is there nobody there? Uh, now? Uh, because nobody. everybody's afraid because of the revolution. There was really bad uh, um, publicity, yeah. you know, really bad press, and I guess that's w sort of one of the points we wanted to make. Here were the uh, the different cities in Egypt. We found the uh, we found the people extremely friendly. And uh, uh, at first, you know, they, they insisted on having armed guards with all the tourists, etc. But pretty soon they just kind of dropped that. And uh, we were in... Uh, 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 go ahead, Alexandria. These yeah. are teenagers, you yeah. know, dressed in the old traditional Arab way now. Uh -huh. And uh, this is Cairo, the big city, as we left. And your standard... Uh, your standard sort of um, pictures with pyramids. Pi pictures with the pyramids. And you but were there. Yeah. Now, I guess that would. The, 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 oh, let me stop it there. Mm -hmm. The uh, the point I guess that we wanted to make there was that uh, we hadn't planned on going to Egypt. Kay picked up the paper one day and it said, you know, the Egyptian tourist industry has collapsed. Everybody's afraid to go because of all the riots and uh, the uh, overthrow of the uh, previous government. And consequently, the hotels are cheap, the tours are cheap, the, the planes are cheap, and we look so at So what it meant it <laughs> is, is it applied to his cheap side? <laughs> <laughs> we thought, hey, why not? You know, it took us about 10 seconds to decide, hey, let's, why not go to Egypt? You know, we found a tour, we found the a little tour company, yeah. and uh, off we went to Egypt. And uh, the few tourists that we m did go had all the same sort of experience. As one English lady said, 
you know, my kids, when they heard I was going to Egypt, said, are you going to tell us what our inheritance is now, or are we going to have to wait until later, you know? <laughs> but um, I guess the, the point was that we, uh, and this is something that you can't do so much if you're working, of course, but you've got to be flexible and ready to jump in on something, you know, if it looks, uh, if it looks interesting. And uh, not wait around and plan for six months or a year all the time. Uh, kind of do it on the spur of the moment. You often get the most interesting things that way. Well, we're going to, my wife and I are leaving on the 25th, I think, of this month for mm -hmm. Cuba. Oh, I wonderful. We've been going for years, you know. Oh, we have too. Yeah. yeah. That, that's on our bucket <laughs> on your bucket list. Yeah. 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 Really, you're going to Egypt. I mean, to uh, Cuba. Cuba. How exciting. For 10 days, yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm looking forward to the sugar cane because I was raised on sugar cane oh. from New Orleans. Uh -huh. And I haven't had any real sugar cane from the field yeah. since childhood, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm sure mm. you have many more adventures other than mm. finding sugar cane in mm. Egypt. <laughs> you know, one, one of the things we found interesting in Egypt was that they had this uh, tremendous sense of humor. And oh. they were really uh, wonderful people. We were talking to an Egyptian lady who actually had lived in Seattle for many years she, as a university teacher, and she was now teaching at the University of Cairo. And she had been at Tahrir Square um, uh, during the revolution, and uh, everybody was carrying these signs, Mubarak, get out, get out, Mubarak, you know, we mm. resign, etc. And so finally, of course, as you know, he did, he did resign. And the next day, they had these signs up saying, oh, we were just kidding. <laughs> and to, to show you what a small... What a sense of humor. Yeah. To show you what a small world it is, um, yeah. this, this lady had her grandson there who was going to university also. And so I asked him what he was going to do after university. And he said, oh, I'm going to go to a small college in Oregon. I'm sure you've never heard of it, Linfield College. Oh, it's God. in our backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and we met a gentleman from George Fox University, yeah. too. So. <laughs> George Fox University is getting a lot of publicity yeah. here, huh? Yeah. OK, so should we go to the next batch then? Yes. Yeah, OK, true. then fine. Um, Okay, this, uh, this was uh, when Kay and I first met, or soon after we first met, we put uh, packs on our back and wandered around Mexico, and uh, southern Mexico, Chiapas, Oaxaca, down near Guatemala, you uh -huh. know? And we took rural buses. That's something that I think a lot of people should uh, uh, consider. And the, the architecture, this was just a couple of architecture shots from, uh, um, from, Egy from uh, Mexico that... Um, and uh, libraries City. and things, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we were really surprised at the uh, interesting architecture. And then, of course, with different kind of architecture, you've got these great uh, ruins at Albi and uh, at uh, different places like that. The, um, no, Alba, was it? Well, Mount, Mount Alban, Mount, Monte Alban, that was Monte it. Alban, yeah, yeah, near, uh, near Oaxaca. Yes. And then uh, Palenque, out in the, out in the, um, out in the jungle as well. We, uh, we, we found Mexico a lot more interesting than we thought we would, really. And uh, just by taking, uh, just by having backpacks and going on rural buses, we f and with no Spanish virtually, we really enjoyed it. Um, now this one is, is this the Andaman? The Andaman. Yeah, these are the Andamans. Now the Andaman Islands, you see they're way off in the center. India's off to the left, the Andamans are in the center, and Asia's off to the right. Um, they're owned by India. We'd never heard of them before, and uh, we were in India, and somebody said, oh, golly, they talked about the Andamans, and we thought, hey, let's go off and see the Andamans. We'd never been there. You know, there's uh, small little hotels uh, in parts of the island. Part, much of the islands are off limits to everybody because there's some indigenous people who live there, mm -hmm. and uh, we traveled around in... Uh, it was quite an exotic little place, and the the most interesting thing in it probably were these huge, uh, this huge prison that you'll see some of it here. The British had used this as a penal colony uh, when India was fighting for its independence in the twenties and the thirties and the forties, mm -hmm. and so you had these immense, this immense jail with gallows and everything like that, um, that a lot of turned out to be quite famous people from an Indian viewpoint lived in. And, uh, How long were you there? Oh, uh, we were only there for a couple of weeks. But we were in yeah. India for six months. But six yeah. months. Yeah, we'll yeah. get into India later. But see, this is like this is like something out of Tolkien. Uh, uh, these are these are British barracks and buildings that have been totally over. They just left them, and they've been totally overgrown with different uh, trees and everything. And then there were a lot of Hindu temples and things of that sort uh, 
there as well. So we did, we just found it really an exotic place, and we didn't. Do, I guess the point here was not to travel, uh, not to uh, worry about reserving things. Just sort of go, show up and see what's there. And this is a totally different thing now. Alaska, we just took. There's a ferry. Um, the Alaska ferry system is quite an elaborate ferry system, and uh, one ferry comes up from Bremer to, uh, from. Um, um, what's that city? Uh, you know, up north of Seattle. Anyway, uh, Bellingham. 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 Sorry, Bellingham. Yeah, we went up. Uh, took it. Took it. Bellingham. Went up and looked at Alaska, and uh, th it's like taking a bus. You know, they say it stops at different places. You can. Uh, you get off. You get off the boat. Stay for a couple of days, pick up the next uh, ferry that's coming along, and just work your way up and down. We found that if you had a car, it would have been a big inconvenience. Mm -hmm. The towns are small. You can just get off the boat and uh, wander around the towns by public transport. Mm -hmm. This is Skagway. They had uh, kind of a, a bar room uh, melodrama, etc. You know, uh, some of these towns like Skagway have got a lot of cruise ships coming into them, and at eight o'clock, at uh, six o'clock at night, the whole town dies off almost because everybody goes back to the cruise ships, except for people like us who are from the ferries, you know, <laughs> wandering around. And, so, and some of these towns, like uh, this one, um, the f the cruise ships can't get into them, so uh, you can just go and wander around the town. And no. we stopped at a senior center several times and really got some wonderful stories from the seniors that have been there for years. So when you go to these different places, is it more by impulse or spur of the moment, or do you plan ahead of time, we're going to go to this part, part of Africa and that part of South America, or what? How, does it, uh, how do you Both. arrive at where you go? Both. It depends on what... Yeah, that's true. I mean, we, di we didn't really plan the Mexican one more than a couple of, you know, a week or so ahead. And Egypt was done very much spur of the moment, but other ones, uh, and the Andamans also. But then Alaska, I guess we thought about it for a couple of months, because mm -hmm. you know, we should go up to Alaska this summer, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I, I guess one of, the, one of the things we discovered is there's no particular rule. That's why when we're just calling it observations on travel, because observations on the... It just depends on which way you do it. Now, like in, in this case, uh, so far you've seen we've been doing nothing but public transportation, you know, either taking buses in Mexico or just walking uh, in the Andamans or uh, taking a ferry up to Alaska. But this next thing where we, uh, we're going to show you now. Let's do the next one. Just yeah. We'll take a break in, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. in, in a minute. Uh, uh, a quick question before that. The what's, what went on in Egypt? Uh, and uh, Mubarak's uh, overthrow. Uh, why did that occur? Well, I'm not quite sure why it occurred. There was just more and more. There's been a lot of festering resentment in, in most of these countries for a long time now. And uh, um, it was, I think it was, uh, it was set off by the uh, revolution in Tunisia. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, they saw the Tunisians mm -hmm. do it. And what set the Tunisians off? Well, there's a lot of theories on that one, too. This fellow burning himself to death. And then uh, yeah. a lot, you know, uh, it hasn't really been credited mm -hmm. to it, but WikiLeaks had a lot to do with this. Because when the WikiLeaks yeah. stuff came out, uh, the uh, Tunisians were really interested in reading about how corrupt their government, their government, uh, the high officials were. And these were from diplomatic cables that were sent by uh, U.S. By, mm -hmm. by people from uh, the U.S. Embassy in Tunisia mm -hmm. uh, sent it back just to report, you know, what was going on and filling people in. Uh, just the, it wasn't meant for public uh, consumption at all. These people had been living corrupt lives for years, you know, but um, uh, the Tunisians read this. It started to spread around on social media, you know, by Facebook and on the Internet. What do you and think of Bradley Manning? Pardon me? Bradley Manning, the private mm -hmm. who... Well, everybody has different views on that. They've been looking a long time to try to find some kind of harm that he's done. I think that the, my opinion is that the stuff that came out with WikiLeaks, was, it just showed how much lying has, has taken place, how, how, how the government has deceived us in so many ways. I, th I, think, it was extremely, I think it was extremely valuable. Yeah. What's going to happen a year or two from now with Egypt? It's, 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 uh, it's gone. What's going to well, happen? Well, what we saw when we were there, and we were at the university for quite a few days, and uh, I just felt like it was chaotic, and, and there wasn't much direction. But 
I've seen this before. Uh, yeah. What happens is you've got a tremendous mass of people who are dismayed, who have very poor lives, who have no jobs, no money, etc., and they're very unhappy. And, and uh, they get the idea, and uh, a lot of people feed this idea, of course, that, hey, change the government, and that'll change your life. And it doesn't. Okay, you, you change people up at the top, but you still don't have a job. You still don't have any good water. Uh, there has to be a deep-seated change in the society, in the, in, the structure of these, in the structure of the country, to make a difference. And, of course, that's not happening. I saw the same thing. I, I was in Rhodesia when the blacks were you know, getting ready to throw over the whites. And yes. uh, they thought, that, you know... Um, you get rid of the you get rid of the white farmers, and uh, suddenly everybody's going to be good. You're not going to live in poverty anymore. Well, of course that didn't happen. I mean, it's much more complex than that. Same has happened in South Africa. The same happened in Russia. It's not a matter of just taking off the uh, you know uh, getting rid of the top people. Uh, you've got to change the structure of the country and the economy, and that takes years and a lot a big program to do it. You know. So is it possible to, to change things enough to have things be, be rad uh, radically different in countries like Egypt and Rhodesia and those countries? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's going to happen. Who knows? But, I mean, it certainly hasn't happened so far. I know the, now that all the Egyptians who are, now they see their lives are the same as they were before are looking, are, are complaining to each other, you know, and it's fragmenting. You've betrayed the revolution. Oh, no, it's your group that has, you know. Why aren't we, all, why aren't we any better off? And they're not better off. Are we looking for an Egyptian FDR? <laughs> <laughs> Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Hey, wouldn't that be nice? So mm -hmm. we should probably stop and take a little break here, take a little breather, mm -hmm. and then, then we'll resume. Can we take a break now in the control room, please? We are back. Now, for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, or perhaps you were just channel surfing and stumbled across the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals, and about what it, whatever it is that we've decided to talk about. And we've been talking about... Uh, travel with John and Kay, and we're going to continue in where we left off and have some more interesting stories and some slides that are a little clearer uh, in the second half uh, about uh, where you were. And take it over. It's your turn now. Okay, fine. Well, um, another <coughs> a couple of places that we went to were places that we actually did use a car. In this case, you know, to hire a car. Now, it's not the kind of thing that we always wanted to do, but uh, some, if you haven't got too long and it's a big place to go to get around, uh, we found that waiting in bus stations um, sometimes, you know, took up, if you don't have too many days, it takes up a lot of your time. So sure. uh, we w one of the places that we really enjoyed, and I know Kay really liked it particularly, was uh, Sri, Sri Lanka. And that was a car and a driver. Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. We had a we had a driver, a guy who knew his way around. Th mm -hmm. Those are big uh, Buddhist stupas, they call them. Oh yeah, uh, we got the whole picture now again. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, tell them about what your impression of Sri Lanka was. 
I thought it was the most beautiful place I'd been. <laughs> it, was, it was just overwhelming to me. The, uh, s some of the wealth of colors and, and the people and the food and I just everything was just all. Mm. These are some dances that we were seeing. Yeah. And then the uh, famous. Did you eat local foods and the various oh, places? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Always, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Look always. at those are the buses. And and we're and these are the tea plants. We're the type of people that eat on the streets. And as long as it's cooked and it's hot, we'll eat it off the streets. So a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Did we get sick? Yeah, once or twice. When we were six months in India, we did. But mm. uh, uh -huh. we didn't mm. in Sri Lanka or anyplace mm. else. But pretty much you ate the local cuisine. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The, the Sri Lanka people. Sri Lanka is a really great country to visit. I mm -hmm. think you know we really enjoyed it. And then we also, uh, I'll just, uh, we just check out Costa Rica here, and then we can talk about both of them if you of want. Of course, sure. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> again. We went down to Costa Rica. Um, it's a country that, uh, as is well known, I think. It's uh, beautiful. I've been there. Yeah, they decided that mm -hmm. instead of exploiting the uh, natural resources, they would uh, use them as tourist attractions. So they've kept their forests and they've kept their wildlife to a large extent, and then they charge you to go around and look at it. You know, which <laughs> makes a lot more <laughs> sense than cutting it down. Let's face it. You know. Yeah. And uh, I think a, another thing that saved them a lot of money is they don't have an army, and uh, that's so they don't have. That's John Son Eric. Oh, oh yeah, uh, that Sun was our driver. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm. Look at that. Yeah. Oh yeah, they uh, like hedges done like dinosaurs. Uh huh. And um, uh -huh. these are the uh, sloths. There's a lady from Washington uh -huh. who's got a sloth rehab little hospital there, and we stopped and looked at them. They're cute little animals. Uh -huh. Now this is uh, Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yeah, we yeah. went up uh, up to Nicaragua next door just just for a, a short time to take a look. It's much poorer but much livelier. And this this weird bridge is the only way you, from where we were the only way you could get wow. into Panama. And you had to share it with those big trucks. Hello. Yeah. You had to squeeze against the railing. Huh? Yeah, 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 you did. <laughs> Literally, yeah. but but at any rate, so and and in that case, we had a car too. So we're not like purists, you know. Oh no, we've got a hitchhiker. We've got to take a take rural buses, you know. If uh, if it makes sense, fine, grab a car, you know. But we learned one little trick, of course, is that uh, when they say it's going to cost so much a month <laughs> or, or so much a week, this is so much a week. Oh oh yeah, and uh, do you want to put a little extra insurance on? It's only thirty four bucks or something, you know. They. <laughs> Uh, it turns out, of course, that that was per day, but they don't tell you that. That wasn't done in Costa Rica, by the way. That's that was done in the U.S. That's yeah. a little trick they have in the U.S. in mm -hmm. Florida. So watch out if you're renting a car. Now, yeah. when you're traveling like that, how much uh, uh, luggage do you have to carry? Uh, Not carry much. Very, very little. Yeah, you, you want know. to just put it on a backpack, you in know, a small backpack. You really? don't. Yeah, when we were in Mexico, um, <laughs> well, the backpack is great because then you don't buy a lot of souvenirs. Mm -hmm. And the only souvenirs I bought went in John's backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you're a little shorter than you yeah. are? <laughs> no, but I think, uh, I, I think that if there's one rule that you want to follow, it's to really travel light. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's just, you know, kind of a change of everything, you know, two changes of shirt and underwear and uh, one change of everything else. And that's about it. And a and light jacket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you want, uh, yeah. And you want to be able to wash them in little hotel rooms at night. You don't want to stay in nice hotels or anything. The, you know? the they dry overnight in the hotel room? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The one thing that I do travel with, and John and I both do, and that is a sleep sack. And I think that that's important now because um, we have been in places that we were felt a little uncomfortable about, and you know, bed bugs and isn't something you want to bring home with you. And mm, so we do it. use a sleep sack, and mm. I think that's critical. But they're real light, you know. It's just like a sheet. You buy them over from REI, and they're like. Yeah, you know, they're real light. It's do like do a pillowcase or something. Up, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And they have a mm. hood you can put over your head mm. if you wanted to, too. But it's just a mm. piece of nylon net. And mm. I um, soak it in some mater some uh, uh, chemical I get from REI. Mm. And it um, permeates the sleep sack. And so hopefully you don't get any bugs. <laughs> 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 OK, should we go to and the next uh, one here? Yeah. OK. This is, um, okay, this was India, and this is, uh, th this and the next piece here are to illustrate. We were in the southern part of India, uh, down near the bottom, in a place called Tamil, a uh, state called Tamil Nadu. And uh, 
one of the things you notice in India when you get there, no surprise, of course, is the crowds. Um, there was a lot of people. And, a lot of uh, Indians, huh? Oh, boy, I'll tell you. And um, we, were, we were teaching school there. Uh, we ended up uh, staying in this area for six months. And um, that's the electrical. That's grid. the electrical grid. Can you imagine? <laughs> Honest to gosh, can you imagine fixing that? You know. Yeah. So you know now why the electricity went down several what times. What were you teaching when you were there? I was teaching video, video to uh, to school kids, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, wow. Kay was teaching mediation. But um, let's see, what have we got here? The uh, that's the elephant festival. Oh, the elephants, yeah, elephant festival. Uh, we, we found India extremely colorful and charming. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it can be pretty, uh, pretty rugged sometimes uh, when you, you've, you see a lot of very poor people. Wow, and what's uh, the weight of that beast on that yeah, truck? Just, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was an the elephant. The lady on the tr has an arrow through her cheeks, too. Yeah, these were uh, festival people, uh, Hindu parades, you know. Uh huh. And tell us what else we're seeing here, babe. Uh, um, I don't know what that is, John. <laughs> oh, no, these are these are big parades, yeah. uh, religious religious parades with huge uh, uh, figures of uh, mythological creatures. Uh huh. And um, and cows were everywhere. There, that one. And you can tell oh. them what happened. Oh, yeah, that. that's right. That cow I got tired of her and knocked her off the path. <laughs> she, she was going along looking at it, you know. They're pretty arrogant, these cows, cause they, cause they're, they're sort of but everywhere. But they're sacred, right? That's why they're yeah. sort of sacred. Well, well that's right. They can do, it, do anything they want. Yeah. Um, these are poor people. Oh, yeah. This is, this is where I was teaching the heart and hands pledge. I will not use my hands or words for hurting myself or others. Yeah, and well, it tell them about that in a second when we just finish okay. this part here. Yeah, because that's uh, that's from Salem. What is that stuff and on that mat? Onions. Uh, onions. onions. Yeah, I can uh, smell. Yeah, them. these are uh, just markets. Uh, these are. Uh, they're making market. wood by uh, yeah. lumber by hand and yeah. bicycle these shop. Are the, yeah, and that's a bicycle repair shop. You know, I mean, they just do it out in the, uh, out in sort the open, just huh? out in the open. Yeah, uh -huh. and uh, that's that's a laundry. These people are washing clothes for, for other people. And, uh, Generally speaking, do you think the Indian population is, is more happy, is happier than the average U.S. citizens? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, it depends. Now, th this is a, the local video store. Every one of those titles is pirated. Um, uh, there's, these are the aboriginal people in a part of India. We, I mean, they were so poor, they were just living in little grass huts, you know? Mm -hmm. It was really a shame. Look at how black that person is. Mm -hmm. That's caste system, different shades of... Yeah. Um, there may be something to that. I don't that's, know. But that's the four home. But mostly in southern India, people are a lot darker. Uh -huh. and, but they were just enormously friendly, you know, all of the people that we met. These are uh, the people that Kay was talking, uh, uh -huh. talking to. Here, I'll just stop that before we get to the next one. Tell them about the Hearts and Hands Pledge. Um, it, Hearts and Hands Pledge was started in Salem. And when I went to India, because of what you mentioned before, I failed miserably at mediation and teaching mediation because of the hierarchical system that they have there. And um, a, a girl, for instance, maybe having her dorm mother there, she wouldn't tell that dorm mother that she wasn't happy with her or any, anything, any of her feelings. So mm -hmm. feelings were really hard to get out in the open. But the heart and hands pledge went over very well. And uh, I had, I don't know, about 300 people came eventually from the school and surrounding areas. And, the, mm -hmm. and uh, even some of the workers in the cafeterias came in and took the heart and hands pledge. And they cut out the little hand that they drew around and wrote the pledge in the middle and signed it and dated it and then you would see them on lockers and uh, it said tell them what the pledge is. I will not use my hands or words for hurting myself or others and you would see in like uh, for instance we had an assembly and the girls made bracelets or um, what do they call little macrame bracelet type mm -hmm. of thing and everybody was that took the pledge, the girls would give one to them. And so during an assembly, a lot of times you'd see one of them holding up their hand. And you'd look around and you'd see a lot of them holding up their hand where they'd have the little bracelet around. And so it was solidarity that, yeah, they took the pledge and they believed in it. And say the pledge mm -hmm. again. I will not use my hands, hands or words. Or words. Or words to, to hurt. For, I will not use my hands or words 
for hurting myself or others. For hurting mm -hmm. myself or mm -hmm. others. And that was started in Salem by a Salem mm -hmm. person. And well. it's actually going around. And what uh, do you do with a person to get them prepared to make this pledge and have a meaning? Actually, not much. Um, I, I went to an assembly and I explained what the pledge was. And um, if you took the pledge, I expect you to honor the pledge. And they were very much on honor in India. Um, and we had some um, students from a foreign country there that were um, giving punches and hurting each other. And the nurse told me that that pretty much stopped um, all of that injuries that she had seen coming into her clinic um, when they took the Heart and Hands Pledge. So they were It hurting. sounds secular, huh? The Heart and Hands Pledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not religious. I mean, it's not no, related I mean, to any no, particular it's religion. Just, no. But it's, it's it a wonderful... It has wonder a ring to it, a certain yeah. feel, yeah. It's not, I mean, it, it originated yeah. in Salem. It originated in Salem, and, and it's um, definitely... Salem, Oregon, of course, you yeah. viewers. <laughs> <laughs> and it's definitely gone around the world. Um, oh, because we had people there from Bhutan and North Korea, I mean, South, South Korea, Korea, and uh, Japan, and Australia, and England, and so um, all of those kids took the pledge. Okay. Anyway, uh, the other point of this section was about volunteering, but we'll, the next section is about volunteering as well, so we could talk about the general principle of volunteerism after we see this next part. Is that okay, Don? Yes. Okay. I forgot to turn my cell phone off. Uh-oh. <laughs> and now it'll go on now again. We went down, uh, <laughs> another volunteering uh, mm -hmm. that we went was um, down in Mexico. Um, <coughs> there was a, a group uh, from a, D a Dayton church went down, so uh, we went down with them. They were helping to build um, a church down in a, a, a little, a poor rural town in Mexico. And so uh, we stayed there, and the, uh, the Americans and, the, uh, and all the Mexicans in the village all got together as well, and they, they were putting up, putting up the roof and pouring the concrete, et cetera, for this particular, uh, for this particular church. For most of the uh, people who went down from, and there was only about 12 of them, you know, from Dayton, um, they didn't, uh, they'd n most of them had never, you know, traveled before. That's not true for all of them, but most of them had not traveled before. And so it was quite an experience for them as well, you know, to meet the Mexican people and to, and to d do this kind of work. And it, it was, th they were pretty religious, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. the, the idea is uh, they thought they were sort of doing the Lord's work and everything, which is fine, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess this brings up, uh, so we went to and saw the volunteerism in Mexico, and we saw volunteerism, we were volunteers in India. And um, that's an extremely interesting way to see the world. You know, there's a, if you go into websites, you'll find that there's a lot of schools and a lot of different places are looking for help from people. And uh, so you can go down there, and, and that's what my son is doing right now. He's down in Honduras working, you know, in a, as a volunteer in a, uh, in a, private, in a small private school. And, um, how does a viewer find out how to, yeah, to do that kind of work? That's one of the things. It's website tricky. Or? Websites, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of, well, that's the problem is there's too many websites, you know. Yeah. I mean, ah. and the thing is, and, mm. and a lot of cases, and some of them are scams. You've got to watch out. Oh, sure, we'll get you a nice job in this uh, school in China, $3,000, please, you know. They want some money uh, from you. Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of yeah, them. You uh, pay to volunteer, and we don't do that. Yeah, um, you you've got to. It takes I, some uh, research, a lot it, of research. It takes a lot of work and a lot of phoning around and talking to people personally who may have been places. This one in Mexico, for instance, was was uh, told to us by friends, uh, by a friend mm -hmm. who had uh, who had taught there, mm -hmm. and that's one of the ways to do it. But um, in India it was the same way, and in, in Madagascar, um, that was I found that off of the web, and it was a, it's a Canadian uh, outfit. Yeah, just a small group of churches in Ontario are supporting the school in Madagascar. We haven't gone there yet. We're going next month. And how long will you be there again? Oh, uh, this time, I don't know. <laughs> two months. Two, two months. Two, two or three months. months. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, really, I mean, in a lot of cases, the volunteers, they really want you for six months or more if you can, you know, for if you're going to be able to teach the kids things. Oh, other volunteers, like building the church and that, that's, that's shorter. But... Um, if you you can often go down to a country and then find out you know where they're looking for volunteers certain schools certain philanthropic organizations or uh, volunteer organizations because they they're not all on the web by any means you know about your expenses for being there 
do, do they help you with what it, your we expenses, or do you have, have to spend your more money to support yourself while you're there? No, we support ourselves, and we usually pay for our own um, airfare to wherever we're going to work. Going to stop over on the way back from Madagascar uh -huh. and spend four days in Paris. But usually, oh, that's usually though, when you yeah. when you're there, <laughs> usually when you're there, they'll, they'll give you a place to stay and they'll, and yeah. they'll pay your meals. And meals, you know? yeah. Oh, so it doesn't okay, really cost that you that anything. Yeah. Much, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, they'll always put, they'll the, always have a place for you to sleep and eat. Madagascar too. I went around to some of my friends and family and ask them for donations, and um, the literacy rate is like 40 percent in mm. Madagascar, and the school is trying to raise that, especially for girls. And we found that the girls, when they reach puberty, they often stop uh, going to school mm. because of the issues that they have. Uh -huh. And so um, I'm going to try to, to help them not <laughs> stay out of school, and we're going to try s with sewing machines. We're going to try making some uh, sanitary products for them with the sewing machines. And so I raised enough money to buy a couple of sewing machines, treadle machines, that I learned on when I was a child. Son of a gun. Yeah. Were they, a, were they singer or white, the treadle machines? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. I My mother had a singer, you, a, pet, a pedal treadle sewing, machine. Treadle yeah. machine, yeah. yeah. She so used to she, uh, let, let me uh, uh -huh. Use three and one oil on the bottom, yeah. but she wouldn't let me put any oil on the top because <laughs> I was a little kid, and she said, "We're ruining all the stuff she's working on." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, well, memories. It's going to be a neat experience treadle for me to go back. I have a treadle machine that was my mother's that she bought when my brother was born, so I do know, and, and I've sewn a lot on them. And also, really? there's some of the hand wheel ones too, and I haven't worked with those, but I think I could probably learn that. So I'm going to teach them some sewing and a little bit of sewing, I hope. Um, that's wonderful. It, yes. it will be. I, 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 what I'm impressed with is, is that the family and friends that have got behind me to support me for this project, um, that overwhelms me more than anything. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next uh, point that uh, we were going to bring up was uh, a trip that we took to uh, Asia recently. Um, we started off... We had, um, wow. we belonged to a, uh, jo yeah. we joined a group Tokyo called Tower. Friendship Force. This is Tokyo. Uh -huh. And uh, we were pretty impressed by that city. But you know, one of the things that struck me about Tokyo was that there's less traffic in it than Portland. Oh yeah, the, the family that we stayed with were really nice. They cooked us uh, all this um, different mm -hmm. kinds of Japanese food. And um, we they traveled look happy. Yeah, oh, they oh, they're are. They wonderful, wonderful people. people. Yeah, but yeah. you know, we found that Tokyo had less traffic than Portland. Really? And, uh, yeah, it was, and it was very clean, and there was no. Um, there's lots of joggers. They have rapid they transit, though. Don't they? Oh gosh, oh, yeah. yeah, everybody's on but transit. That's the whole tell point. Tell them how yeah. much it costs to park a car for 20 minutes. Well, I'll, t I'll give you um, just one example. The uh, fellow we were with had a nice, uh, uh, he was a businessman, he obviously had some money, but he, he was driving us around uh, the center of Tokyo, and uh, as I said, there was very little traffic. And he pulled off to a, a place where there were a few empty parking spots by the side of a building, and uh, took us in for, for lunch. And when we came out, put in his credit card uh, to leave this little parking spot, and it was 7,000 yen, which is 100 bucks. He paid $100 to park for a, like half an hour, 45 minutes or something. Mm, you know? Unbelievable. I know. But, uh, and so that's why <laughs> then I suddenly realized we're not, people aren't driving around very much. You know? <laughs> but the, the subways are packed. You know? It's mass transit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they have the bullet trains very too. Very efficient. Yeah. yeah okay. But we, we were really impressed with, ja with Japan. And then we went over to Taiwan. And uh, that was, uh, I didn't know what to expect from Taiwan, but it's a really nice country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, uh, it's, well, I mean, there, here are the um, pagodas and things like that, but that's more for tourism, I think, really. The, uh, the cities themselves are very modern. And we're in a, a city, Kaohsiung, uh, in southern Taiwan, and the, um, it's going very green. They've got bicycles and uh, bike paths and things of that sort there. There's uh, there's bike paths. They're becoming more very ecologically conscious. Uh, look at those bikes. How they look. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, that's. Uh, 
We've got about two minutes left before we're oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. shut yeah. down. All right. Oh, okay. Well, let's just stop it there then uh, at the moment. Um, or l let me just go through to where it's dark. There we go. Um, <coughs> yeah, go ahead. So uh, what have you got to say to my viewers about your travels and your adventures and uh, that would be of value to them? I think the travel clubs that we found out about are something that people might want to know about. Mm -hmm. and maybe yeah, fr friendship Force. Friendship Force. I'm very uh, impressed yeah. with. Friendship should, Force. That's a, that's a group we went to Asia with. And they, you, there's 370 or so Friendship Force clubs around the world, and the clubs will exchange each other. You may go, uh, our, our club might go to Paris, or the people who wanted to go, you know, and you'd stay with Paris members. And so we stayed with Tokyo members and stayed with Taiwanese members. And uh, so you're in somebody's house. You're not in a hotel, and they know their way around. And so people should just Google it. Look up Friendship Force on uh, Google, and there's an international headquarters, and there's a, a real nice, there's a good club in Portland and another one in Salem. Friendship Force. Yeah. We just, it's a, we're really Three, two, would a deal when you come into their home. And, and we've had people come to our homes also and stay. And we felt very blessed uh, with the people that we've had. They're just wonderful people. What happens to your home here while you're away months on end like that? Do you have a babysitter, a house sitter, or what? Um, well, we're fortunate. We have an apartment in the basement. Uh, we don't rent it out, but we can have people come and stay. And so uh -huh. then they can take care of our house. And our neighbors are wonderful, too. And I have, we have two granddaughters. and. They have it established that if John and I are ever kidnapped, the, the ransom for me is $10,000, and for John it's 1000 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Well, I certainly enjoyed uh, you, you guys being here tonight. And uh, perhaps in the future you'll come back and tell my viewers some more about Madagascar and your other adventures. Let you know what it's like. Yeah. yeah. So you see this miserable thing, this modern cell phone? I, I turned it off, but it turns mm -hmm. itself back on. As you can see, I didn't do it. <laughs> so it's close to time for us to stop. So keep my pens and pencils handy. We may, you may want to jot down something that we'll show you in the closing uh, credits. So thanks again for watching. And I, I invite you to give us feedback, uh, both positive and negative, about any aspect of the show, and I mean it. It helps us to give you a better show in the future. I want to tell you about a few public service announcements how to get the Di Dr. Don show uh, on the internet. You can go to my website, www.donbayam.com, and click on present day activities, and there's oh, maybe a hundred shows on there from years ago. Uh, so then you can go to watch Dr. Don's shows on the web. Go again to my website and click on favorite links. And my next PSA is the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU has been in ca kind of hot water now, coming down on the wrong side of that Supreme Court decision about Citizens United. But I've been a member of the ACLU for 40,000 years, it seems. And the American Civil, li Civil Liberties Union has been a great defender of our civils. And the next PSA is uh, to get Dr. Don shows broadcast by other stations around the country. Uh, ask your local public access station in the city where you are to go to www.pegmedia.org and learn how to get my show so you can broadcast this. this okay, and ending corporate personhood. It's really important to end corporate personhood. I think we're in such fine, awful shape because of corporate personhood. Go to www.movetoamen.org. I'm getting excited, excited because the clock is running down. So it's time to say good night. Uh, thanks for watching, and remember KFC. Not KFC. It's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable. To you too, and you too, and you too. <laughs> thanks again for watching. Good night.